thanks to MPB for sponsoring this video. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my full review of the Sony A6700, a mid-range mirrorless camera with a 26 megapixel APS-C sensor, 4K 120 video, and built-in stabilization. This is part one of a two-part review focused on the A6700 for stills photography. Part two will cover its video capabilities, and if you're a hybrid shooter or just simply curious, you should check it out as it delivers some of the best performance at this price point. Announced in July 2023 at a body price of around US$1400, the A6700 is Sony's first new hybrid camera with an APS-C sensor since the A6600 launched four years previously. Sure, there's been other APS-C models in that time, but they've been more focused on video and vlogging in particular, whereas the 6700 is firmly focused on people who take both photos and videos. At first glance, the 6700 would appear to be a 6600 with the sensor from the FX30 cinema camera coupled with the autofocus system from the A7R5. And while both represent the headline upgrades here, there's a wealth of extra features that I'm going to cover in this review. I'll be making lots of comparisons against alternative models and rivals, including the A6400 seen here on the right. When you first pick it up, the 6700 most closely resembles the A6600, sharing essentially the same compact body shape with a flat top and viewfinder perched in that top corner. In your hands, the weather sealed body with a magnesium alloy chassis feels small but robust and comfortable with a generous grip that's a tad deeper than before. It weighs around 500 grams with battery, but no lens. From the top, you'll notice a similar layout with no pop-up flash, but at least the hot shoe now supports Sony's latest digital MI shoe accessories, like the ECM M1 microphone launched alongside it, and I've got a separate review of that if you're interested. The shoe also allows you to record four-channel audio where available. Sony's now moved the built-in microphones to the front of the camera, and they can sound pretty good, but do beware of the rattly strap lugs, at least on my test sample, which can ruin handheld footage unless stuck down. Eagle-eyed Sony fans may notice the C1 button, now circled in red, and defaulting as a more convenient movie record button than the old corner location, while the bump on the power collar has rotated to the right-hand side. Much more importantly though, the 6700 finally gains a front finger dial to complement the two rear thumb wheels, while photo, movie and S&Q modes have been sensibly relocated to a new dial beneath the main exposure mode. Around the back, the layout remains much the same as the 6600, including the flat wheel, which doubles as a joypad, making an impressive three control dials in total. I'm also happy to find a new AF on button, although sadly Sony has continued to resist fitting a joystick to this series, leaving you to use the touch screen or the joypad to reposition the AF area. Fujifilm's XS20 as well as Canon's R10 and R7 all have AF joysticks, and I personally prefer them for adjusting the AF area. How about you? In a major change from previous models though, the 6700 switches the old vertically tilting screen for one that's now side hinged, allowing it to flip out to the side angle up or down, as well as forward to face you or back on itself for protection. As such, it may no longer be on the optical axis when flipped out and involve two actions to angle up, but I always found the viewfinder eye cup or hot shoe accessories would block the screen on previous models, so again, personally speaking, I'm happy about this change. The screen panel itself is a 3-inch touchscreen with 1.03 million dots and a 3x2 shape that can display photos without blank bars. Now this is different from the 6600 and earlier models, which employed wider 16x9 shaped screens, which may have been filled for video, but cropped for photos. I personally prefer the new shape, but the panel resolution is beaten by several rivals, which have now switched to 1.62 million dots. The viewfinder is unchanged, still delivering the same 2.36 million dot resolution as the 6600, with the same 0.7x magnification and fastest refresh of 120 frames per second. To be fair, Canon's APS-C cameras, not to mention the Fujifilm X-S20, also all share the same viewfinder resolution, and it's fine for general use, but it is nothing special. You'll need to step up to the Fujifilm X-T5 for a higher resolution viewfinder from an APS-C body. The 6700 also shares the same FZ100 battery as the 6600, and while it's now rated for few shots in its predecessor, perhaps depending on how CEPA counts them, it still remains a highlight here, good for around 600 still photos. In my test shooting action with a mix of shutter types, I captured way more than 600 photos in practice though, and for video I managed to record a single clip of 4K 25p in 10-bit, 
lasting just over two hours on a full charge. As far as I know, there is no battery grip available, but then neither do most of its rivals. Meanwhile, the ports have been rearranged behind multiple flaps, similar to the layout on the ZV E1. Behind the upper flap, a 3.5mm microphone and USB-C 3.2 ports. The latter, a merciful update to the micro USB of earlier models in this series, enable to not only support power delivery for a quick charging and camera, but also lets you use it as a standard UVC, UAC webcam for live streaming to computers or phones at up to 4K 30p. Behind the lower flap are a 3.5mm headphone jack and a micro HDMI port, so sadly no room for full-size HDMI here, but not surprising given the body size and as far as I understand it, there's no support for raw video output either. Nestled between the port flaps is a single SD memory card slot, a much more convenient location than inside the battery compartment of previous models, and now also supporting UHS-2 speeds. But anyone hoping for twin slots will be disappointed. For that, on an APS-C camera, you'll need a Canon R7 or Fujifilm X-T5 upwards. One of the highlights of owning a Sony camera is the E-mount supporting a wealth of native lenses, not just from Sony, but also embracing third parties. This is in some contrast to Canon, whose RF mount remains essentially close to third parties, and right now only has three lenses designed specifically for APS-C models, meaning that most owners will be fitting full-frame lenses or adapting older DSLR models. Not ideal, but of course a tough arrival is Fujifilm, whose long-established X-mount is designed for APS-C alone and has a comprehensive selection of quality lenses available, so my advice is to see which system has the lenses you want and which you can afford. Oh, and unless you want to knock around spare lens, I wouldn't even really bother with the 16-50 to kit zoom if you want to get the best from any Sony APS-C body. It's certainly no mistake that Sony supplied review samples of the 6700 with the considerably superior, albeit considerably more expensive, 16-55, to 2.8 and 15-1.4 lenses. You can see the view here with the 16-55 to 55 at 55mm without IBIS, before entering the menus to enable steady shot and returning to a much less wobbly view. I find a steadier view when composing invaluable, but in terms of slower shutter speeds, the 6700's IBIS allowed me to handhold a sharp result at 55mm or 83mm equivalent at speeds down to a tenth of a second versus 160th without. That works out at around four stops of compensation in my own tests, so roughly similar to what I achieved for Fujifilm and Canon's latest IBIS systems. In the first of the headline upgrades, the 6700 inherits the 26 megapixel back illuminated CMOS sensor first used in the FX30 cinema camera. This may only represent a mild boost in resolution over the 24 megapixel sensor in previous models, but as a much newer back illuminated design coupled with the latest image processor, it potentially has greater quality than these numbers suggest. I've got loads of sample images for you coming up, but let's dive straight into a resolution chart comparison. Photographed with the A6700 fitted with an adapted Sigma 40mm art lens, one of the sharpest that I have, and one that I've used in many of the reviews for comparison. With magnified views of the 6700 on the left and the 6400 on the right, the latter also representing the 6600, you can see there's essentially no benefit in terms of pure resolution to those two extra megapixels, at least for still photos. These results are roughly similar to Fujifilm's 26 megapixel models, so if you're after significantly more detail at low ISOs from APS-C, you'll either need the 32 megapixel sensor of the Canon R7, or the 40 megapixels of the Fujifilm X-T5 and X-H2. And if you'd like to see a resolution chart for the X-H2 and X-H2S, check out my review of that camera. How about noise levels? Let's run through an ISO sweep, starting with the 6700 on the left at its new extended low sensitivity of 50 ISO, before the 6400 joins in on the right at 100 ISO. These are all JPEGs out of camera, as the 6700 wasn't supported by Adobe at the time I made this review. As I increase the sensitivity one stop at a time, both cameras deliver pretty clean looking results up to 1600 to 3200 ISO, with noise only really starting to become visible from 6400 upwards. That said, it's pretty discreet until you reach the very highest values of 25,600 to 102,400 ISO, and from these results I'd say there's actually little to choose between them on high ISO noise, at least for JPEGs. The newer 6700 sensor is arguably a tad better in some colour patches here, but it's very minor and personally speaking I wouldn't make a decision based on this alone. But how about sensor readout speed? 
Here's two shots that I took using the electronic shutters on both cameras while panning quickly with the 6700 on the left and the 6400 on the right. And again, I'd say they're actually looking very similar here. Now, as you'll see in my review of the movie capabilities, the rolling shutter is greatly improved on 4K video, but for still photos, the 6700 skewing looks pretty similar to the 6400 in my tests. So use with caution when photographing fast moving subjects or when panning quickly. The user interface and menus have received the same revamp seen on the A7R5 and FX30, including the main view that shows a bunch of settings at a glance, with the chance to adjust some of them by touch as well as traditional controls. It's a useful view to have, but to me feels a lot like an expanded version of the existing function menu, which also remains available here. So do we really need both going forward? Running through the image quality menus, the 6700 lets you choose between JPEG and two types of HIF formats, with four compression settings, three resolutions, and four aspect ratios. Best quality find JPEGs typically worked out between six and 15 megabytes each in my samples. There's also an HLG option for still photos, which can look good on HDR TVs. Meanwhile, raw shooters get to choose between lossless compressed and compressed versions, with the former working out around 33 megabytes each. Note there's no uncompressed or low resolution raw options. I'll be testing the dynamic range when the raw files are fully supported by third-party software. Nestled amongst the bracketing modes within the drive menu, you'll find focus bracketing, making its debut on a Sony hybrid APS-C model. This lets you capture up to 300 images, gradually adjusting the focus between each at increments of one to 10. You can use the mechanical or electronic shutters here and also set a delay from a separate menu since the traditional self timer is on the same drive list and can't be selected at the same time. Unlike some rivals, Sony won't stack the images for you in camera, leaving you to do it afterwards in software. I've used Helicon Focus here to stack my group of 62 images, which has the desired effect of delivering the depth of field that I required for this macro close-up of a British pound coin without having to close the aperture right down and suffer from diffraction. Exploring the menus, you'll also find a bulb timer, again inherited from the A7R5, and letting you preset an exposure between two seconds and 900 seconds. This allows you to easily make long exposures beyond the usual 30 second limit without the need for a cable release. Just put the camera into bulb mode, choose the exposure time in the menu, set the self timer to avoid touching the camera and you're all set. Unlike the A7R5 though, you won't find a pixel shift mode to boost the resolution on the 6700. Moving on to bursts, here's a sequence shot at the top H plus speed of the 6700, which remains the same 11 frames per second as its predecessors, whether you're using the mechanical or electronic shutter. I'll show you lots more bursts in a moment, but for splashes, you may prefer models with faster frame rates. In terms of autofocus, the 6700 inherits the AI processor introduced on the A7R5, along with its broad array of subject recognition. Select human from the menus, and the 6700 will use everything it knows about limbs and poses to recognize and track bodies, heads and eyes in a wide variety of environments. Select animal and bird, and the 6700 will again recognize and track bodies, heads and eyes of a wide variety of creatures, whether static or in motion. You can also switch to separate animal only or bird only for greater accuracy. Insect now has its own setting, and while still in its infancy compared to human and animal detection, it still does a fair job at surrounding various specimens with a box, or even aiming more tightly around the body and head parts. Cars and trains now have their own setting, and both aim to place a focusing box over the front of vehicles, although if a face is recognized inside, it will take priority. There's also an option for aeroplanes, and all subject types have additional options to further refine how you'd like the system to respond, although like the A7R5, this can get complex pretty quickly. Sadly, for all of Sony's algorithmic prowess and dedicated AI processing, there's still no full auto option, which simply attempts to recognize the actual subject for you. I realize such a mode could impact recognition speed and accuracy, but auto subject modes are already working pretty well on both Canon and Fujifilm's latest cameras, and I'd personally like to see it as an option from Sony too. It really does make life a lot easier. Of course, if you're only interested in using a manually selected AF area, the 6700 can do that very quickly and accurately as seen here, but let's give it something more demanding. To illustrate how the 6700's handling, 
autofocus and bursts all work together in practice, I'm going to show you a series of action shots that I took with the 6700 fitted with the E70 to 350mm f4.5 to 6.3G zoom lens, a lightweight combination which proved formidable for wildlife and sports in my tests. All these bursts were taken at the top H plus speed of 11 frames per second, which, while no faster than its predecessors, proved fast enough for most of the action that I was shooting. That said, there are some occasions, like anything involving a water splash, where faster speeds can be beneficial. And this is where rival models with quicker options in their electronic modes of 20 and even 30 frames per second have an advantage. And if you're looking at the Canon R10 and R7 or Fujifilm X-T5, all sport mechanical shutters up to 15 frames per second. Both Canon and Fujifilm also offer pre-burst modes on recent models, which maintain a rolling buffer as you half press the shutter, ensuring that you never miss a moment like a bird unpredictably taking flight. I'd really like to see this on a Sony. The top mechanical shutter speed of the 6700 also remains 4,000th of a second, and while this is the same as the Fujifilm XS20, I still hope for something faster after all these years. In some consolation, the electronic shutter on the 6700 now goes up to 8,000th of a second, but again its rivals go faster still, to 16,000th from Canon and 32,000th from Fujifilm, which, believe me, is invaluable for shooting large apertures in bright light. If you're shooting JPEG only, the buffer on the 6700 essentially lets you keep shooting forever. In contrast, I only managed 132 best quality JPEGs out of the Canon R7, but it was shooting 32 megapixels at 15 frames per second. The Sony is also capable of shooting long bursts of RAW files too, albeit in the compressed format. Autofocus is unsurprisingly where the 6700 triumphs, and I could rarely find a subject or situation where it faltered. Humans were recognised in every situation I tried, including kite and towing water sports, which often fooled other systems. Bird and animal detection did a great job at finding wildlife, and while busy backgrounds can still prove problematic, I'd rank Sony's recognition as among the best out there. Vehicle detection also worked for me while photographing a Ferrari meetup at Brands Hatch Racecourse, with the 6700 recognising and focusing on the closest car in the frame, the instant one appeared, allowing me to come home with a lot of keepers. I did notice some skewing when using the electronic shutter, which could prove off-putting when panning to follow fast cars, but to be fair this is no different from other non-stacked rivals at around this price point, and switching to the mechanical shutter resolved the problem. Besides, you don't need a silent shutter in this kind of situation anyway, and the top mechanical shutter speed of 4,000th of a second proved fast enough here even with a telephoto lens. Just before wrapping up, I wanted to mention the 6700's predecessors, which may actually be good enough for your needs, with used models available at potentially bargain prices. I buy all my used cameras from MPB, and I'd like to thank them for sponsoring this video. If you don't need Sony's latest subject detection or 4K video beyond 30p, the earlier 6600 remains a solid option with IBIS, the big battery, and much the same photo quality, and I found several in light new condition at MPB for around £950. I'm quoting pounds as I'm in the UK, but MPP is a global platform that also operates in the US and across Europe. Or how about the A6400, which I used to film most of my YouTube videos for several years? Not too shabby, right? And while it lacks the 6600's IBIS and big battery, it's still a far shooter, which I still use for all of my college sports, and it's available from around £600-£700 from MPB, depending on condition. Going further back still, there's the original A6000, lacking 4K video and surely too old to be considered today, right? Well, think again, because this is the camera that I took to several editions of the Tour de France to take all these photos that I'm showing you, proving that it's still a worthy option for fast action and an absolute bargain at around £350 in excellent condition, or even a bit less if it doesn't have to be pristine. I've been using MPB for several years and can recommend them whether you're buying or selling photo gear. Check them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. Right now to my final verdict, during which I'll show you more photos that I took with the A6700, mostly using the 16-55 2.8G zoom, a great partner for this camera. As always, you can download a selection from my review page at cameralabs.com if you'd like a closer look. The A6700 becomes Sony's most capable hybrid APS-C camera to date, confidently capturing high-quality photos and videos in a wide variety of situations. 
For still shooters, the highlight is Sony's best autofocus system, effortlessly recognizing and tracking a wealth of subjects, including people, animals, birds, insects, cars, trains, and aeroplanes. Couple it with the E70-350 zoom, and you have a formidable combination for wildlife, sports, and action that remains very compact and lightweight. Meanwhile, macro shooters will appreciate the inclusion of focus bracketing, while long exposure fans will enjoy the bulb timer, and everyone benefits from the improved stabilization and triple control dials. But despite employing Sony's latest AF system and best APS-C sensor to date, the actual photo quality and burst speeds look similar to its predecessor in my own tests, and the body features do remain more mid-range than high-end. The 2.36 million dot viewfinder, single card slot, mechanical shutter no faster than 4,000th of a second, 11 frames per second bursts and no battery grip all place it firmly against other mid-range models like Fujifilm's XS20 and Canon's EOS R10 and both of those models sport faster burst speeds and options with pre-bursts as well as AF joysticks. If you're after a high resolution sensor and EVF, twin card slots and faster shutter, you'll need to spend more on models like the Canon EOS R7 or Fujifilm's X-T5 and X-H2. Put it this way, the 6700 is not a high-end APS-C camera to rival Fujifilm's top models, but equally, it's also considerably cheaper. Ultimately, the A6700 makes most sense when judged as a hybrid camera, with many of its best upgrades benefiting video shooters. But if you're mostly going to be using it for stills photography, I'd recommend comparing the pros and cons very closely with the competition, not to mention its predecessors. Overall, it's a solid camera I can easily recommend, but the choice between it and the XS20 and R10 will involve carefully weighing up individual specs, your preferences on body style, and crucially, which system has the lenses you want and can afford. And that's the end of part one of my A6700 review. Part two is devoted to the video capabilities where the camera boasts a number of unique features in its peer group, including 4K at 120p. And when that's ready, I'll link to it here. Also look out for my reviews of the new 70 to 200 F4 Mark II, an M1 microphone that were launched alongside it. Let me know what you think of the A6700 in the comments and which is your favorite APS-C camera. Thanks for watching and thanks again to MPB for sponsoring this video. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.